As we move into part two, we are shifting gears from the early Lutheran church fathers. And again, you'll notice I'm skimming and I'm shooting through this, the editorial process. My hope is, small commercial here, my hope is that there will be a subsequent book that comes out with the full and complete set. Uh, but moving from, if, if I wanted to, I could read you the manuscript, but um, we didn't bring pillows to have a nice <laughs> relaxing time here. Uh, so this is a much condensed version of it. Uh, but at, commercial aside, we're shifting gears from Lutheran Church Fathers of Luther's time and, and uh, the immediate, immediate preceding generations, and we're moving into how does this take shape specifically within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, because that's the context in which particularly this research has focused its question. And it's been of personal concern. I just make a, a, a kind of side note to this. Um, having served as director of Christian education and being the son of two Lutheran school teachers, uh, this is a particularly personal area of research. I've had numerous interesting conversations. It's a really interesting thing to talk, mentioning this to my father, retired, longtime Lutheran school teacher and principal, and he looks at this and he's thinking, you are barking up an interesting tree. Mm -hmm. But good on you for trying to, to, to get some clarity here because what you have, and, and just kind of putting some context to this, is, and there'll be some quotes that get at this a little bit as we progress, but there is this feeling uh, as a commission minister that you kind of straddle an odd fence where there are times in the way the LCMS functions that you are clearly not a part of the laity and other times when you are clearly told that you are and that's a very inconsistent message. And that leaves the largest group of church workers in our synod kind of puzzled as to, well, where do we properly fit? Uh, and if, if, if uh, memory serves, and, and Dr. Mueller, if you recall this, I, I was emailing you questions related to this prior to my even serving on faculty here uh, as I was pondering this question. So wonderfully appropriate that we come to today, and I've spent um, an inordinate amount of time pondering, and I think coming to a reasonable conclusion and providing clarity in what is often very murky waters. All right, so let's move into Walther and the situation in the early LCMS. Isn't that a lovely mug? <laughs> I honestly searched out the most flattering possible photo. I promise you, there are ones that I could have been, I could have been mean. That was not the intent. This is actually, this is not bad. Uh, with C.F.W. Walther. Our study of Lutheran theologians on this matter comes closer to home in the Missouri Senate. Walther was one of the principal figures in the founding of the LCMS, having taken up key leadership at a time of great start struggle among a group of Saxon immigrants. An assessment of Walther's, Walther's understanding of the doctrine of ministry would be lacking if some comment is not made with regard to the context in which he found himself in leadership. Now, this, to say the name in the LCMS, you don't speak. Martin Steffen <laughs> organized a group of 707 people who set sail for the New World on five ships in 1838. Four of those ships, with 602 passengers from the original group, arrived in New Orleans in January of 1839. Continuing up the Mississippi, a portion of this group settled in St. Louis itself, while the majority elected to establish their new home in the hills of Perry County. Now for the fun stuff. The story of the fall of Martin Steffen, which we will not get into exhaustive detail. There are other areas you can dig in for this one. Um, it's a complicated and at times controversial story. Uh, Steffen was noted as a strong, perhaps dictatorial leader. When accusations of sexual and financial misconduct surfaced, these Saxon immigrants who risked a great deal in following him to America quite literally sent him away across the river 
exiling, uh, exiling him across the Mississippi to Illinois. <laughs> Be gone with you, go to Illinois. <laughs> what an interesting solution. <laughs> In this context, Walter stepped in to assume the leadership and pastoral headship of this new community. Who signs up for that job? One of the early concerns that surfaced focused on the theology of the call and that of the public ministry. Without Stephen as their bishop, the forefathers of the LCMS were uncertain that they had the authority to ordain pastors to provide for the ongoing ministry of their immigrant community. Without a bishop, they believed they had not the formal connection, well, they didn't have the formal connection to the church back in Germany from which to request pastors ordained by a bishop in Germany. Through his studies of scripture and of Luther, Walter came to argue that the right to call and in fact to ordain pastors rested in the local congregation and not in the external authority of a bishop. The church, in the absence of a bishop, was perfectly within its theological rights to call both a new bishop and new pastors to serve its people. A church body such as the LCMS may, as a gathered group of local churches, establish a training criteria for pastors based on scriptural qualifications for that office and they would, in the years to come, do just that, believing they had the authority to do so, derived from the local congregation to the synod in that direction. As Walther worked to solidify what would become the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod through the establishment of churches, he also worked tirelessly on the establishment of educational institutions to support that ministry. Building on the strong connection between the church and the school in their homeland, the founders of the LCMS placed a great emphasis on the establishment of schools. At times, the school was opened even before a new church was planted. Naturally, along with the establishment of schools came the necessity of having well-trained and theologically faithful teachers. Many times, these early teachers were the pastors called to plant the new church. However, as the task of managing both roles became too burdensome, other trained men and spe were specifically called to teach were needed. As the system of schools grew and the number of teachers increased, Walter was repeatedly called upon or believed it incumbent upon himself to offer some teaching on the relationship between the pastor and the teacher. Picking up on the terminology explored previously, Walter discussed the role of the Lutheran teacher as an auxiliary ministry. Walter held that Lutheran teachers, he held them in high esteem. The use of the term auxiliary was not considered by him to be an insult, as it is sometimes used by others. This was not a way to denigrate or place less value upon their work. A balance was being maintained in how Walter understood auxiliary ministry. In his classic work, The Church and the Office of Ministry, recently republished and retranslated, Walter in Thesis 8 <coughs> states that the preaching office is the highest office of the church from which flow all other offices of the church. Expounding upon this thesis, Walter notes that the pastoral office must of necessity be the highest in the church and all other offices flow from it. For the keys embrace the whole authority of the church. In the highest office, Walter includes elders, bishops, rulers, stewards, etc., while he calls those in the inferior offices deacons. This is not to say that there is but one inferior or auxiliary office of deacon, but to connect the nature of the auxiliary offices to the establishment of deacons by the apostles. Walther continues by explaining how the church is able to establish auxiliary offices, stating, hence, the highest office is that of the preaching office, with which all other offices are also conferred at the same time. Every other office in the church is part of the same, or a helping office. That stands at the side of the preaching office. 
whether it be the office of elder, do not, uh, excuse me, possessors of which do not labor in the word and doctrine, or the ruling office, or the diaconate, the office of service in a narrow sense, or whatever other offices the church may entrust to particular persons for special administration. That is an interesting phrase tucked in there. Hang on to that. Therefore, the offices of the Christian day school teachers who have to teach the word of God in their schools, distribution of alms, sextons, precensors at public worship, and others are all to be regarded as churchly, holy offices, which bear a part of the one church office, standing at the side where they take over a part of the one church office and stand beside the preaching office. Walther offers examples of auxiliary offices established and utilized over the course of centuries by the church. There is no expectation that these are permanent offices. Only the pastoral office is such a permanent office. Auxiliary offices, rather, are established to deal with a particular need and grounded in the particular context in which the church has found itself throughout the centuries. All, however, are to be considered holy. With this emphasis on educational ministry through the local Lutheran schools, the LCMS was immediately in need of an office of Lutheran teacher. This has not waned. Rather, the church has instead developed additional auxiliary offices in order to address the evolving needs presented by the ministry of the church in our culture. The source of all these offices is a single office, that of the office of public ministry. This ought to continually remind those who serve in auxiliary offices, not of their lesser station, but rather of how they are aligned in their own ministry. Looking at early LCMS influences, and having wonderful conversations. Yes, I noticed you start giggling immediately, Tom Park, <laughs> as we had some conversations on this. There was an influence across different Lutheran church bodies as they are forming. There is a natural tendency as the LCMS is forming, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, you have the Buffalo Synod, you have the Wisconsin Synod, you have various local synods, and the question of how many of these would become unified together and how they influence one another. Well, one of the key influencers in understanding and one of the key counterparts in their understanding of auxiliary ministries comes from the Wisconsin Senate. So it is helpful in order to paint a full picture to do so by examining some of the larger context in which the LCMS found itself during its formative years. One such element of that context can be seen in the theology of the Wisconsin Senate. The Wauwatosa, and having now actually been to Wauwatosa, boy, that was a cold day, uh, or Wisconsin Senate position, argued that while the scriptures instituted a gospel ministry, no specific form for that ministry is prescribed or directed. The concrete form of pastoral ministry could be argued to be simply one form of public ministry among others. As we will see later, this position found its way into the LCMS later in its history. Walther's use of Predigtamt, pardon again with the linguists, those of you who know German, my apologies, and Amt, has been at the center of much of this controversy. John Brug of the Wisconsin Synod argued that J.T. Mueller's translation Predigtamt as pastoral office falsely implies that the pastor, not the congregation, holds that office. He sees this translation as obscuring other offices. He argues that Walter is less than clear in his use of language in distinguishing between pastoral and other offices. In Krug's <laughs> estimation, positing that the pastoral office is the only divine office of ministry leaves the Lutheran teacher wondering about the legitimacy of his or her own call. 
implying in any way that the ministry of the Lutheran teacher is based on delegated authority gives the impression that the teacher's call is not really an office of ministry. Peppercorn notes that the Wauwatosa understanding of Walther's Omt was an office of min uh, was of gospel ministry taken in the abstract, which may be a which may be made concrete in a variety of forms. The LCMS has historically argued against reducing the office of public ministry to this form of what it would call functionalism. This is the two positions, in a sense, that were rubbing up against each other and helping the LCMS to distinguish itself in contradistinction to the way the Wisconsin Senate moved on this. Since the time of Walther, auxiliary offices were often described as branching off. This is, again, more LCMS terminology, as branching off of the pastoral office. Walther puts it this way. The preacher should therefore never forget that the school teacher is also counted among the ministers of the church. It ministers an auxiliary branched, an auxiliary office branched off of his office and is likewise his colleague in this respect. P.E. Kretzman concurs that auxiliary offices branch from the pastoral office and are distinguished by the specific functions each auxiliary office is created to be responsible for. Holding or bearing Bearing an auxiliary office conveys a divine call due to the office having its source in the pastoral office. What gets confused here is a proper distinction between ordained and commissioned ministers. While there are occasions in, in which in his private writings where Walter suggests an equivalency between assistant pastors and teachers, that was an interesting stunner. He, in a sense, puts it out there that the associate pastor and the teacher have an equivalent, equivalent call. Now the LCMS formally has never adopted this, and there's good reason to. Pardon me here. This reduces, here's the reason, this reduces the ministry to mere functions and rightly may be seen as a low view of the pastoral office. To say an, ass a, an assistant pastor is less a pastor has never been our position and ought never be. The ministry of the pastor is more than the execution of a set of tasks or functions. The divinity of the office establishes something more to the office than those functions associated with it. This seems to be what is at work in the argument of the Wauwatosa men who argue that the office of ministry generally is seen in the abstract, while its functions take shape in the concrete form of various offices, including the pastoral office. Walther understood the Lutheran teacher to be a branch office of the pastorate. He further notes that despite the Lutheran teacher not being given the right to vote in synodical conventions, he was not truly to have been considered a layman either. He was rather a holder of the office of public ministry, though not fully. This was not, however, a view held by all during the formative years of the LCMS. 